All right, so now let's talk about what virtual memory is. And I'll give you a hint here. Virtual memory is all about indirection. Remember, we mentioned that there are different address spaces for the program and the memory, and virtual memory is about the indirection pointing between them. So virtual memory is a layer of indirection. And this comes from the general idea that any problem in computer science can be solved by adding indirection. If you've got a problem, add a layer of indirection, and we can almost always solve it. Let's take a look at how this works in virtual memory. So without virtual memory, we don't have indirection. The program address that the program uses in MIPS is exactly the same as the RAM address. So if the program tries to load from address 1024, it's going to look for RAM address 1024. So here's our 32-bit address space the program guarantees. And here's our 32-bit address space if we only have one gigabyte of RAM in our computer. And we saw before these addresses are fine. Address 0 is going to map over here to 0, 1 to 1, etc., all the way through the first gigabyte. But what happens is when we start using addresses that are beyond the first gigabyte, they don't have anywhere to map to. So with this direct mapping here, we're going to crash if we try to access more memory. So virtual memory is going to solve this by adding a level of indirection. So in virtual memory, we're going to take the program addresses and map them to a RAM address. So instead of going one to one like this, we're going to have a slightly different mapping. So here's virtual memory, and it's going to do this mapping. So we have our 32-bit program address space. We still only have one gigabyte of memory installed in our computer, but now we're going to have this map in the middle. And this map is going to provide exactly this indirection that I was talking about before. So let's see how this can work with the map. So here's address 0. Where's it going to go to? Well, we look in the map. The map sends it over here to RAM address 1. OK, you know, why not? It can map it to anywhere it wants. Here comes the next one. It maps it up here to address 0. OK, sure. Here comes the next one. It maps it into here. Now we've done the same thing we've done here. We've mapped everything. It's not the same mapping, but it's just a mapping. What happens now when we access this next piece of data? Well, now that we have a map, this next piece of data can say, hey, it's not in memory. It's somewhere else. It's on the hard disk, for example. So our program's not going to crash. It's going to know it has to go get the data from the hard disk before it can continue. So what virtual memory does here is it gives us flexibility in how we can use our memory here. So this mapping allows us to use our memory in a more flexible way. So let's take a look at how virtual memory solves these three problems that we looked at before. So here's our same 32-bit address program space and our same 1 gigabyte 30-bit RAM address space. So we have 1 gigabyte of memory installed, and MIPS promises 4 gigabytes of memory space to every program. Now we've got this map in the middle, and we've got a disk over here where we can put stuff that doesn't fit. So let's take a look at this. We're going to map some of the program's address space to disk when it doesn't fit, and when we need it, we'll bring it into memory. So here we are with virtual memory, and remember the program address is going to map to the RAM addresses. So the program goes and tries to load address 0, goes to the map. The map says, ah, OK, address 0 is over here. No problem, you can access it. So the virtual memory has mapped program address 0 to RAM address 1. Now the program wants to access address 1. OK, so we go into the map, and the map goes over here, and it maps address 1 to RAM address 0. No problem. Go to program address 2. It goes and maps it down here. That's fine. Now here's where it gets fun. So now we try to load the program address 3, the next one here. And this one doesn't fit into the amount of memory we have here. So this part here took up our first gigabyte of memory. Now we're trying to load something beyond one gigabyte. What's going to happen? Well, when you do this, you go to the map, and the map says, hey, I don't have any more space in your memory that's installed in your computer for this data. What am I going to do? But because I have this flexibility, I can move the data around. So it's going to go put it on the disk now. So virtual memory is going to find the oldest piece of data in memory. In this case, it's this 0, 1 here. It's going to go and move it out to the disk. This is called a page out. It's taking this page of memory and writing it out to disk. Then it's going to go and update the map. So the map here still says that this is in memory. We're going to update that map to say, nope, it's not in memory. It's on disk. Now that we've freed up this memory here, now we can go ahead and access program address 3 here and put it in the memory that we freed up from that earlier data. So by having this mapping, we can use our disk to give us the illusion of unlimited memory. So as long as we have 4 gigabytes of space on our disk, we can always give every program 4 gigabytes of memory because we can do this mapping and put as much of the data on the disk as we need to. So that's how virtual memory solves the problem of not enough memory. Now here's a question about virtual memory performance. What's going to happen to the program performance when the data it needs is on the disk? 
Well, we're going to get really bad performance. Reading from disks is slow. Disks are thousands of times slower than memory. So if we have to put the data on the disk, it's going to slow down our performance enormously. This is why people tell you if you buy more memory for your computer, it'll run faster, because you'll have less time you have to go to the disk to access data. Now let's take a look at how we solve problem number two. This was the holes in the address space. So remember, we quit program number one up here, and it left these two one gigabyte holes, and we decided we couldn't run program three because it didn't fit into either of these holes. Now we're going to have this map so we can be more flexible in how we use the memory. So here's program three and program two. Here's program two's map. And as we saw, program two was mapped into the middle chunk of memory here. But with virtual memory, we can map program three wherever we want. So here's program three's map. We're going to take the first part of program three, and we'll map it up here. We'll take the second part of program three, and we'll map it down here. So now program three's memory split around program two's. But it doesn't matter because this mapping allows us to map any part of program three's memory to any part of our real memory. So we got this added flexibility from having these mapping, and now we could fill up these holes and really use all of our memory. So with each program having its own mapping, we can put our data wherever we want, and we can be more flexible about using these holes in memory. So let's take a look at the third problem here, keeping programs secure. So here's program one and program two. And remember what's going to happen. Program one is going to store your bank balance at address 1024, and program two is going to store your video game at address 1024. So we're going to use maps for them to put them in different RAM addresses. So program one has a map, and program two has a map. Program one is going to go to address 1024, and its map is going to send the data somewhere. So in this case, we're sending the data over here to RAM address one. OK, so it writes to RAM address one. Program 2 is also going to try and access address 1024, but its map is going to send the data somewhere else. So in this case, it's going to send it over here to RAM address 5. So now they write to different places because we have these mappings that make sure uh, even though each one of them is trying to access 1024, they have different mappings that send them to different physical locations in memory, and they don't overwrite. So neither one of them can touch the other one, and we've got this security. They each have their own address space, and they can't access each other's maps as long as we don't map them over each other. So here's a question about program isolation. So we just showed you how you can isolate programs here. Is this always good? If you completely isolate the programs, what's the downside of this? So the pro downside of this, if you do it entirely, is you can't share data. So programs often share a lot of data. But if I have this mapping where they're completely isolated, they can't share that. Now, we can use the same mapping to enable shared data. So say I have a mapping here that maps part of program 1's addresses down here, and another mapping that maps part of program 2's addresses right here. Now they can explicitly share that same data, regardless of where they need to access it. And this is actually very common. So if we take a look at this here, here's the save dialog box from my mail program, and here's the save dialog box from my web browser. You'll notice these are exactly the same. All of the code and all of the icons and graphics for both of these dialog boxes are the same. So you want these to be shared between each program. So the memory that represents these saved dialog boxes, that's going to be shared between the two programs. So we need to make sure they can do the sharing. So save dialog box, fonts, graphics, all those things are examples of data that you want to share between programs.